Hello everyone and welcome to Handmade Hero Show where we code a complete game live on stream. I am going to be looking today at the sort of uh, structural code uh, that we need to add for the new Raycaster that we're hoping will have much better performance uh, characteristics than the old one. Uh, it's been kind of a battle, like this is pretty tough to do CPU side only. Uh, CPUs are just really still quite slow uh, in terms of parallel flop stuff. Uh, they're not horrible, but they're not nearly where, like, a 2080 is, you know? So we'll see. But I think we can do a reasonable job. We're already running real-time with the old one, and the idea here is just to get us up to more like a 60 frames a second frame rate instead of a 30 frames a second frame rate. So we're looking for a 2x speed up here if we can get one. We don't know if we can. But we have a lot of fat left to trim. I think we can speed up the Raycaster. I also think we can speed up the Diffuse... Uh, the specular to diffuse conversion, which is a pretty expensive process right now, and we didn't think through it much. We optimized it, like we put in a simple optimization, which is just to use four wide uh, through it. So we did do that, but we didn't actually take the extra step of thinking about optimizing it algorithmically. So I think there's probably more we can do there that we're not doing now. Uh, in terms of keeping that routine running as fast as possible, especially because we know that given the way the dot product fall off works, that specular only affects diffuse in a specific way. And so there should be ways that we can uh, be more intelligent about our waiting and uh, not have to do as many flops because we're probably doing roughly 2x as many flops in that routine as we actually need because a lot of them are zero. And so if we could do it in a more sparse uh, w like if we could make it <clears throat> a sparse computation instead, we probably could save a lot of actual multiplies. Now, that may not be directly possible, but again, we'll see when we get there. And we know that that takes about a quarter of the time. So if we can get this down 2x or so, and the other one down 2x or so, uh, I think we'll be in really good shape. Um, and uh, I think those are both p potentially possible. So we're going to go for it. And if we do, then we'll be way under six, uh, we'll, we'll be way faster than 60 frames a second. We'll be safely under it, I think. Um, and we will continue to be even more safely under it because all of this is perfectly parallelizable. There's no thread communication whatsoever, and it scales to as many threads as you want. So on future processors with 32 cores, 64 cores as AMD, Basically, as Lisa Sue continues to save us from the collapsing Intel behemoth, uh, we will presumably be able to scale very, very well and get a lot of ray tracing uh, essentially for free. We will do no work. Our game will just run faster. All right. So let's go ahead and take a look here. Uh, yesterday, I think I made some really great improvements personally compared, but that's really more of a statement of how bad it was before, to the downstepping code here where we actually have to do uh, the work of switching to scalar. Uh, this is now much cleaner. This is a much better way of computing those normals than we were doing before. I'm really happy with how that turned out. Uh, I know this can be better. But it's now, I think, within striking distance. So, you know, I think in probably optimizations to this code will not yield any practical benefit at this point because it's down to uh, so few operations. And this isn't this part does, only occurs after everything's done anyway that we don't really care. So I think we've gotten out of the weeds on this. There's still an open question as to how we want to handle the actual sampling. Uh, and we'll probably take a little bit of a look at that at some point as well. But for the most part, I'm pretty happy with how this goes. And mostly it's just waiting to be debugged now. I think it's structured relatively well. Uh, and I think I'm also excited to see how our MinCom uh, are. This this was, some, this was some pretty fun. John was talking about the hacker's delight. And I was thinking about this when he was talking about that. As I thought this was pretty good. Where we do our uh, HComp. We do one shuffle for one instruction and one minpause EPU 16. So it's two instructions to figure out which lane the the raycast float that we wanted is in. Two instructions for that seemed pretty good to me. Like, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know that we could have done a better job than two instructions for that. Maybe we could have, I don't know. But I thought that was pretty darn good. Um, so we'll see if it really works, but I thought it was pretty pretty good stuff. 
All right, anyway, let's take a look now at uh, the, the grid raycast code and just talk about what we actually need to generate. So there's two pieces to the puzzle. One is this part here, which is called walk table. And walk table is the thing that says for any individual location uh, in the grid, how do we know uh, what we should raycast to along a particular ray? And this code is a little bit of a lie right now. So this probably is not gonna work. Yes, we can pull directly out of a walk table. No, we can't then uh, immediately access the spatial grid nodes from there. That's not a plausible thing that can happen. What we actually need to do here is we need to do some kind of a range check and we just need to step through the uh, we need to step through the space until we, like by using deltas basically, right? So in other words, we're on a particular grid, spatial grid uh, location. We need to each time, we need to like go, okay, where do we actually want to step to? And we need to look that up. So one way to think about that would be we have like an initial, so we have an initial grid index, something like this. So it's, it's like, you know, whatever this is, we don't know how to find it, right? But we're going to try and find that. And that's something that would presumably be passed in here. So we would start with an initial grid index uh, that we're probably going to get passed from the parent. In here, we will go through the walk table as a delta. So we would say, okay, we need to take our grid index and we need to add whatever's in the walk table to it. So it'd be something more like a post, like a post increment where we just go to the next thing. Now, the thing about that is, that would be great, except we don't really know what to do at this point uh, about the, when we get to the end, right? There's a couple of different ways we can try to make this work. The problem we're gonna have is, if you imagine, we've got this voxel and we just want, you know, we've, we've arranged it. Memory is obviously one dimensional. So we've collapsed the three dimensions down to one dimension by doing rows, you know, then we stack the rows, then we stack the rows of rows, right? To get a three dimensional thing. <clears throat> and what we'll find is, <clears throat> excuse me, what we'll find is that going off of the top or the bottom of this structure will naturally work with just one range check. Because if we go below zero, that will wrap to a very high number. Or if we go off the end, that will be a higher number than the total number of things in the table, in the, uh, in the spatial grid. And so one range check, which is are we less than that max number, that will give us the termination condition we need, right? However, what we don't know is when we wrap around a, uh, some other boundary. So the stacks will, wrap, will would be checked by just that one condition. But if we go off either end, so we go off like the left or right side or the front or back side of this voxel, that will still wrap around to a valid value, right? It'll just come back on the other side. Much like, you know, when we're doing bitmap work, if we write off the right side of the bitmap, we come back down one row below it on the left side of the bitmap, or one row above it, depending on the, whether it's top to bottom or, or bottom to, to top, right? And so the problem that we face here is we actually need to bounds check this thing in a lot of, in, in several dimensions, right? We, we need to have a way to bounds check it in multiple dimensions. And so what will happen for us here is when we actually look at this, we would need many range checks here. We would need to check uh, off the left side, off the right side, off the front side, off the back side, and then the, just the, the total bound. And doing all of those ifs inside our main loop here, uh, yeah, it's not on the interior of the loop, but it's almost, right? It's the, it's the next worst thing. That's just really bad.
And so I think the way that we want to solve this problem is instead of doing any checking here, which would be inside the loop, I think we want to just do the checking once outside the loop. And then we just adjust this walk count value to say what it's actually going to be. So I think what we really want is when we go down and look at the uh, ray casting here, so when we would ordinarily do the grid ray cast, what we want to do is have something where like the walk count here gets set specifically by looking at how far can this go before it hits one of the boundaries and then it sets the walk count. That way we do the if checks once per ray cast rather than once per node, right? So that's a potential savings of, you know, six, seven, eight times the number of ifs that we're reducing out of the, um, out of each ray cast. And that to me seems like way better, right? So I think that's the clear choice there. So that should just, this should just propagate through, um, and, uh, we would send that walk count down which means that this part here, when we pass the sample direction, is not really gonna quite work the way that I would have expected. Um, I mean, we still could do that here, but you know, uh, I mean, I guess we could, we'll just modify them when we pass them down, right? So that walk offset, uh, in this case, when we set the grid index here, uh, and, and in fact, I suppose if we look at what we would be doing we could almost just do a test on the termination condition as well. So we may want to restructure this a little bit too. Uh, in fact, what we may want to do is this. So we'd basically just have a walk offset and an end at walk offset. That way we can just do something like, okay, there is a walk index, uh, there's a grid index and it's just gonna loop uh, directly using this light sample direction. And again, this is just about removing things from the loop to decomplicate it, right? Um, and so this way uh, we can presumably just do a test. Now, I'll be honest, it's a little bit difficult for me to reason through and I apologize, uh, I should know this and I'm not sure that I do. So if you take a look at the way that this is working, um, so at the end of loops, there's a thing that happens typically, uh, it's called uh, macro op fusion. So there's, there's different kinds of, of fusion that happen in a pipeline. One is called micro op fusion, the other is called macro op fusion. Uh, that involves smushing things together that would normally happen separately. And when you're constructing loops, if you actually care about performance, which we're going to start to soon, in other words, we've got our VTune set up, we're trying to make this routine fast, so you know, normally you're writing a loop, you don't have to think about this particularly much because you're not thinking about trying to you know, extract a ton of performance for it, from it. But in this case, we are. You want to make sure that the the end of your loop is the place where the test is going to happen. And you want to make sure that that test fuses with the loop jump. Uh, and what I mean by that is if you take a look at the assembly language code, um, and, and I can I can show you the God bolt here uh, because it's kind of a, it's, you know, it's a, it's a mellow day here at, at Handmade Hero. Um, so if we were to go <clears throat> to Godbolt and take a look at what a loop looks like when you actually compile it, right? Uh, so let's suppose, I don't know, um, I don't really need this to be called square, but you know, let's just say we've got a count in here and I don't know, yeah, like a float that comes back, <clears throat> something like that. Uh, and maybe we've got a float here as well uh, that's like uh, stuff. So if in here I do a while count minus minus, um, and then in here I do a like star stuff plus plus, um, and I do a result plus equals. So this is a basic like, uh, I'm just doing like basic summation, 
you know, where I'm trying to sum this array that I've been passed in and return the value. Uh, I don't know why, oh, no, it's fine. I thought that red meant like error or something, but. Uh, so if we actually tell like, uh, I'm gonna switch to Clang because I don't know GCC very well. Um, we could also use MSVC. Uh, maybe we will since that's what we're using on the stream right now. Um, so if we take a look at, uh, if we take a look at the assembly language code that gets output for this routine, then what you can see here is this is our loop, right? And the instructions here are this piece of code is summing the float, right? So this is adding a single, like a floating point value and it's a memory op. So it just goes, look, XMM zero is, is holding the sum. So XMM zero is result, right? We're gonna add whatever we point to uh, with RDX, which is this stuff pointer here. We're gonna move RDX forward by four, which is the size of one float, right? We're gonna sub ECX, which is our loop counter. So ECX is count here. And then we're gonna jump if not equal to. And so this sub instruction here is basically saying, look, we don't, we've never talked about this in Hammond here, I don't think. But when you have a sub instruction, this is just x86 assembly. It's just how x86 assembly works. Sub instructions, they, when they hit zero, they actually will, so if you do a sub <clears throat> and the result isn't zero, or you do a sub and the result is zero, it sets a flag differently in the processor's uh, condition table that, I don't know what you want to call it, condition register, whatever you want to, I don't know what the right term is for that, I apologize. My, I didn't program very much x86 assembly. This is old bread and butter stuff and I just don't, I just, my brain pfft, on the terms. But basically, depending on whether it's zero or not, it'll set a flag. And when you do a jump immediately after the sub, that you know that that flag is still set to whatever the sub set it to because there's no intervening instruction, which means that now you can do a jump not equal to to basically say, look, if this thing set the flag that said that this thing is equal to zero, or if it set a flag and it's not equal to zero, right? then we know that we can do a jump right after saying jump equal to zero, jump not equal to zero, right? And we'll jump based on the result of the sub. What that means is that the operation to update the loop counter and the operation to test a loop counter can be done in a single instruction, this sub instruction, and the jump if not equal to can be one instruction. So instead of three instructions, sub, test, jump, it's only two instructions. That's great. Efficient assembly language is good. But actually what happens once it gets into the front end of the chip is that it actually doesn't even do that as two instructions. I believe it does it as one. Because of what's called macro op fusion, a sub jump is actually an instruction for all intents and purposes through uh, the chip. And if we can get uh, some kind of a microarchitectural analysis here. Uh, I don't really know how to use gob bolt. Um, so I don't know how to add the, oh, here it is. So if I switch this to Clang temporarily, um, which should look basically the same, like the code that's generated shouldn't be like wildly different. There we go. Um, so if we look at the code that's generated um, by Clang here and we, what is happening? Okay, so when I said it would be wildly different, I was wrong. They decided to unroll the loop, whatever. Um, so they unrolled the loop and they did a totally different way of doing this routine, which is not what I would have wanted them to do. And holy cow, did they spam out way too much code, which is not really what I would have wanted them to do in this particular case, but oh well. Um, so it doesn't really matter because the comp jump and the sub jump will do the same thing that I was talking about. I just, I want this to I 
uh, how can I convince this to do the thing I wanted to show it to, to show? I mean, I, I can still show it, but I just talked about the sub and I wanted to show the sub, but I can't really make it do that. Um, so like one way to do that would be like to give it an offset it didn't know it could trust. So for ex so just to be clear, I'm sorry, I, I knew what it was doing here and, and maybe you didn't. So what they're doing here is they said, look, we know that we're going to have a, um, a pointer that will tell us where to load out of the array. And that's what stuff is. And what happens is they said, well, look, if we're going to use that pointer anyway, and we're going to be adding the pointer, uh, eight to the pointer each time, we might as well just pre-compute where that will end and test that, right? So presumably if I look up here somewhere, they will just do an add with the total number uh, that's in count, right? Uh, and that's how they'll figure out where this thing is going to end. Uh, at least I assume that's what they'll do. Let's take a look. So they're comparing EAX with ECX. So EAX here is computed where that's a comp here it is so they load the count into eax here right which is going to be like this integer uh and then i'll be honest i'm not familiar with the dil what is that what is I don't even know if I've ever seen that before. I'm not sure what that refers to. That's that's a new one for me. Like I said, x86 assembly, not my strong suit. Um, so anyway, uh, coming through here, where we actually process EAX is we align it to... Okay, so we align EAX first by saying we're going to knock out the bottom three bits of it, right? So it's now aligned to eights. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, and then we clear, we then add the first one. Uh, so whatever the first thing is in the loop, I guess. Oh, and we jump here in case, yeah, man, there's so much preamble. Why did they do all this? What were they thinking? This is, by the way, again, not an expert on this topic, but this is all worse code than the, than the Visual Studio compiler. People ask, like, why don't you always use... Like, this is not good code at all. This code sucks, in my opinion. The Visual Studio code was exactly what you want, and this is not. This just generates a ton of instructions, and it doesn't do anything. Like, this doesn't help you at all, as far as I can, like, I, I can't, this literally would run slower or the same speed, and it, why did it do all this? I have no idea. <coughs> but anyway, so, <coughs> um, yeah, I don't know, here we're comp AX, so here's where we, <coughs> actually produce where did they actually this must be a good trick where they actually produced what eax should be and they're comp they're doing the low part of it the only the 32 bit part of it probably because it's an int so how did they actually oh there it is i missed it it's right there they take edi which they produced up here and they move it into EAX there. So basically they just they just computed where they would stop a stopping value for this and then they use that so they don't have to do a sub. This code sucks. Like this is just bad. Period. Um I don't think there's much argument about that. Like I don't know why they did that, but that's just not good. And I don't understand what the heck happened there uh to be completely honest with you. Like if you take a look at this code here, um, this is exactly right. Uh, I, 
I mean, this is basically one and what, let's see how many cycles this is. So, I mean, this is basically two cycles per, um, at maybe one and a half cycles per. And like, did they actually get better than that after all of this? No, I mean, they definitely didn't. This is dependent, right? So I don't really think, I mean, I guess they amortized. So I guess they amortized that dependency. So maybe that is faster. This unrolling this loop was not a bad idea. That part I agree with. It's just, I don't think this, this didn't get faster. So you could have still done the sub the same way and not done any of this, right? Or most of it. Um, because all you really had to do was just do the one quick test to see how many of these you were going to do, right? So yeah, I just, I don't understand that weird transformation. I'll stop complaining about it now anyway. Um, let me see if I can add a tool though here. Uh, and, and it's possible that maybe if I switch this down to something lighter. Okay, there we go. Uh, well, no, they still do the same trick. Um, I don't know. So I'm sorry, I can't really figure out any way to get this to still use uh, a sub here, but it's fine. Anyway, you, the point is, I wanted to talk about the, the fusion that happens at the end of the loop here. So basically, if I add in here uh, the microarchitectural analysis, and let me remove this so you can see it. Uh, I'm gonna put that like over here because we don't need the source code while we're doing this. Uh, so if we take a look at the microarchitectural analysis here, then what you should see in here, uh, assuming that you can actually fuse these, uh, let me see where we've got here. Did they actually say fusion? Anywhere, um, no, do they? Do they say it? Uh, they don't, they don't say it. I got nothing. So this is kind of a failure and I apologize. Um, I just, if we looked at this in Ayaka, I could show you the part where it says the what got fused and what didn't. Um, unfortunately, that's, I don't think, in here anywhere. Um, so, yeah. All right, this was a waste of everyone's time, and I apologize. Let me just say what normally happens. So, when you do a comp jump or anything else that sets a flag. So a sub jump would also do it. And this is why I say I don't understand why they did this because the sub is free, but I don't know. Maybe they were trying to save register because they just do that by habit or something. When you look at this comp jump, what will happen is the comp jump will actually get fused together into one comp jump instruction. And so, when you normally look at things like how many instructions you can issue per cycle, this won't count as two. It'll only count as one, right? And so that's pretty nice because it means that you can issue it more instructions per clock, assuming that it's available for issuance. And it also means that when it actually travels through the pipeline, because of the nature of how jumps work, uh, you actually don't pay extra micro ops for them either. So it doesn't get blown back out on any, at any point in the pipeline into more ops. They stay fused together forever, is my understanding, and handled by the front end. So basically, you're essentially, when you do a sub and then a jump or a comp and then a jump, and I believe comp is true, sub is the one that I'm more familiar with in X86, but when you do a jump, that jump, like a sub jump, you're basically getting the jump for free. It's not really there. It's just a freeloader on the sub that the front end will just do, right? 
And so it's kind of important to remember that when you're constructing loops, you don't ever, if you're actually trying to get performance out of them, you don't ever want to create a structure for your loop that makes it impossible for the compiler to generate a good post amble like that. That's all. Um, and so like if we were to take a look at how like this loop was set up, you know, um, and I, all I wanted to say was when we loop through here, if we're going from, from and to, I wanna make sure that it doesn't get confused. And I don't think that it would, right? But if we do like first, you know, last or something, and then in here we do like for int uh, index equals first, you know, last index, uh, oops, index not equal to last, plus plus index or something, right? Um, then I just want to make sure that, you know, the compilers don't have trouble with that. And you can see, right, that it doesn't, like, it's still just going to do a comp here on that. Now, that's a little bit cheaty because it's a plus plus index. So, again, I want to start to complexify this just to prove the point uh, at all to myself, uh, which is, like, let's say there's an offset table. And so in here, it's actually, like, uh, plus equals, you know, offset. <clears throat> So as we come through, uh, we've got more work to do. So then you can see in here, now this is what Clang does because it can't it can't mess with the offsets because it doesn't know what's actually happening. So in here you can see it does the adds and then it does a comp and jump exactly the same way, which is good, that leaves it there. It can't unroll the loop, but that's okay. We can't unroll our loops. They, they, we don't know who we're processing next, so it's not really unrollable in that way. There wouldn't be much, you know, benefit to it. And we have a lot of math ops, so stacking up math ops isn't going to help to give you shadow room here. So, you know, that's all I wanted to to verify. And if we take a look at the MSVC output for it as well, I'm assuming it'll be roughly the same. Uh, Let's take a look. So, there it is. Um, so you can see here also, yeah, comp jump, same same thing. Uh, these are all pretty straightforward. I guess I'm not sure how optimal that is because I don't know how many ads stack up here, but I'm guessing this is more or less free. So I'm guessing like this is basically one cycle of total op time. Is that right? Um, this part here. So it's, it's two cycles total, I want to say, because you got to wait. Uh, let me see. Hey, look, it was already on add. So when you're in here, I'm just curious, sorry, I'm rat holing. So when we do an add on ECX to memory, so that's gonna be uh, the, here. Uh, if we take a look, I don't know why I needed to click on that. I just need to look here. Um, so if we take a look at the total cost, you can see that it's one micro op on that seems high wow one micro op on any of these four ports one micro op on one of these two one micro op on any of these ports and one micro op on port four but like is that really how bad an integer ad is like holy cow that's pretty pretty brutal, right? Um, is that really how bad it is? Because if you take a look at like uh, what an ad looks like in, oh, duh, that's the wrong order, sorry. It's this one. That's if you're adding to memory. This is if you're adding from memory. Sorry about that. 
this is that's exactly what I expected to see. So happy. So this means that basically we're gated on the memory, but we can issue two of them. So if you take a look at how this is going to go, right? We got four ports that can issue an ad. We've got two ports that can get the memory for our ad. And so if we take a look at what happens in here, we can say, all right, these two, um, oh, well, and there's only one of these because this is actually the other kind of ad, but still. So this and this can obviously happen together. So that will just occur. This and this could also happen together because those are immediate, so they won't need it. So that would be fine. So this will all issue in the same instruction. And then this, we'll have to wait for that to finish. So this and this, yeah. So I'm gonna say something now that is above my pay grade and like Fabian and Jeff, thank God, don't watch the show. But I'm gonna go ahead and say that this looks dumb. That just looks dumb to me, right? Um, because if you, oh wait, no, 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 okay, no, never mind. I saved myself from embarrassment. Uh, I forgot, we changed this to having to load the offset number, so this is fine. Because I was gonna say, if they'd just done this as a sub, then they could have issued this independently, but we're not doing it that way anymore. We actually need to load this part in, uh, so it doesn't count. So we do have to wait, so we're fine. So this will all issue in one instruction, and then this will issue as soon as it can, but it, even though it, uh, like, uh, I was trying to think of like how it could slip right in here. These can't fuse. So this is four, these are four instructions on the one cycle. They'll issue and complete. And then we have to wait anyway to the next cycle because we can't issue any more instructions, but this will happen on the next cycle and go, right? Uh, while that's happening, it will start to issue some of these, presumably. It would probably try to issue these three while it's doing this, like on the same cycle it issues this, right? So it'll get some, this will be like a one and a half cycle loop throughput kind of routine, probably. That'd be my guess. Um, so I don't know exactly, I forget how you get Clang to do its little dance that's kind of crappier than Ayaka, but at least it still exists. Ayaka kind of got uh, sidelined. Uh, but if you look at the... Um, if you look at the LLVM MCA code here, uh, it, it tries to give you an estimate. We need to put in those little, uh, those little doodads, uh, LLVM MCA marker defines. Uh, where do they go? Where do they go? Where do they go? Um, is that how we do it? Yeah. So you got to do this nonsense here, but this is just how, so in order to tell this thing, like where to actually, where the loop is, I think you got to do this. I don't know if you put it, I don't know where you actually put it, um, for loop analysis. Uh, do they have an example? Because, like, for Ayaka, for example, you, you do, like, basically that. And that's just so you'll get the loop post, the jump, right? Because the jump, the loop jump will happen here, you know? Uh, so, anyway, if we take a look here, uh, we can say, you know, what are we actually doing, right? Reciprocal block throughput. And you can see, see yeah, like, we're, we're at 1.2 cycles per block. And again, the reason for that is because if you look at what actually has to happen, um, this part here, it blocks because these two things are serially dependent. You have to wait for this one. These have to finish before this one can go. So you can then grab some from the next loop, but not entirely, right? If you didn't have to wait, if, if this here did not appear here then this whole thing could issue one cycle per loop and again that's because you get four cycles per instruction on a skylight core but these five these two fuse so you end up only issuing four 
And so you would be able to do one whole loop per cycle. But you can't because this EDI is a dependency. So you actually can't do a perfect issue. You have to grab some from the next loop and it's this constant like slight stutter. So that's why the reciprocal block throughput here is 1.2, right? Not one. I don't know if anything I just said made sense, but that's what happens. <laughs> um, you can also see the port spam. Uh, and hopefully this makes some sense because I showed you that thing about, hey, you can issue ads on lots of ports. So you can see here the load ports are spammy because people are loading all over the place, right? And oh, sorry, those aren't the load ports, my bad. Uh, they are four and five. You can see the load ports uh, happening on the two memory ones here and here. And they're spammy because again, both of these instructions issue could issue on either port and we're a stuttery loop because we we first the first time through we issue these three and then these two and then we grab this one and we right, we we start to do this like weird like you know beat pattern so it's spammy rather than just one one uh, and then the ads can issue all over the place they can be zero one uh, five and there's one more I think could issue. Ads usually can issue on at least zero, one, and five, but the integer adder was, I thought, had another one, and six. Um, so uh, zero, one, five, and six. So you can see those getting spammed here. So that's all this crap, right? So those four ports are getting spammed with the actual ad, right? This ad gets locked because probably ad SS is only on zero and one. Uh, maybe, I don't know if that's actually true. Let's take a look. Yeah, it's only on zero and one, right? So that's why you don't see that spamming out to the other ones because it can't go there. So you know this one's gonna hit these two in a beat frequency based on the offsetting of the routine. Uh, and then you know that your uh, scalar ads are gonna spam out uh, further because they they have two more ports. They, they, there's four integer adders and only two floating point adders. Um, so hopefully that makes some sense. I'm sorry that this part's behind my head, but you only need to see that. I mean, that there's nothing over here that you care about. Uh, so again, that's what happens. Why I can't find the micro-op fusion or macro-op fusion stuff listed here, I don't know. Maybe it doesn't do that. Um, uh, yeah, I don't understand like why we can't get that information. Um, kind of bummed about that. Um, I mean, maybe, maybe comp doesn't fuse, maybe only sub fuses, uh, right? And that's why it's not showing it. Um, uh, I don't know. So normally you would want a tool like this to tell you about fusion. Um, it doesn't seem to do that. And then maybe that's because comp doesn't fuse or something. Uh, I'm not an x86 assembly jockey, so you know my... Uh, I'm, I'm the wrong one to say like, hey, it should or shouldn't fuse. But uh, yeah, it's just a bummer. Sub jump does fuse, let's put it that way. And add jump does fuse with immediates. But it could be that register register comps don't fuse. Um, yeah, sorry. Anyway, that was disappointing and depressing, uh, but you get the idea. Anyway, back to our loop. So what I want to do here is just have the walk offset uh, and the end at walk offset <clears throat> be a test like that. 
I'd like to be able to to check the end of the loop for fusion and make sure we're doing that in a way that's amenable to it because there's other ways we can write this, obviously. Uh, and then at that point, well, I guess this is actually grid index <clears throat> now. I think, uh, and we look up the new one uh, each time. Wait, but that's not, no, 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 sorry. It's still walk index. Uh, so <clears throat> we start with the grid index uh, somewhere. I'm gonna call this initial grid index. And then I'm gonna have end at grid index. Uh, and that way we can just say that we're going to start the grid index here. I guess this would require us to increment the walk table pointer though, but I suppose that's fine. So the grid index just always would start at whatever it tells us to start at. <clears throat> Uh, we would want to check the grid index isn't, you know, wherever this is. And then we would want to do a grid index plus equals walk table plus plus, right? I think. Um, I think we want something roughly like that. So we just read out of the table for whatever our update is. And then this just tells us when we actually stop. <clears throat> and again, I don't know if maybe what we should do there is just a while sub. Um, so you can see why I'm a little bit weirded out by that. I'm not sure it really makes sense. So maybe we just won't. I changed my mind. Didn't like the way it looked. So I think what we'll do here is actually send down a count. So we'll just do like while count minus minus as we were doing before. The grid index will get initialized to some initial direction. Uh, and then uh, we just go as, as we go as far as this thing tells us to. So that way we know this is a sub jump at the end of it. And uh, I also think we can change this to a do while so there's no preamble. So this way it'll only have the end of the loop and it won't have the beginning, which is good. Uh, and the grid index here will just get initialized to something. I think that's what we want. I think that also means that this is not what we want. And so I'm going to change this back to just be ray direction. Uh, walk table. And um, walk count. So we loop on the walk count. <clears throat> uh, we pass in like some of this information about like where we're starting and so on. Um, and off we go. And we can pack that information together if there's weirdness in the calling or anything like that, but that all seems a little premature. So I think that's a good enough setup um, I'm pretty happy with, with how that looks. And this <clears throat> unfortunately needs a preamble. So the problem that we're going to have here is that nodes can very well be empty. And so if a node is empty, then we want to skip it. So So I think the hardest part about all of this that we're going to end up f hitting is just how we tell how far this thing has to go, right? Yeah. So 
so just thinking it through, the walk count is going to be by far our biggest problem. Everything else now can be completely pre-computed. So everything in the walk table can be pre-computed, and it'll just be stored in the H file. So we literally won't have to do anything for that. We'll just load it, and that's it. So the problem as I see it is that the walk count at the moment is unfortunately um, I'm not sure how we're going to generate that because what's going to happen is when you're inside, when you're going, okay, I'm at this grid location, I want to cast this ray and I know there's this many entries in the walk table. You then need to figure out where you would stop walking <clears throat> in order to not wrap to not exceed the bounds of the table. And I just don't know how we do that. I mean, one way is to use a, another lookup table, but boy, does that seem kind of expensive. Uh, but like, you know, you, you want some way of, you want some way of figuring out, uh, yeah, let's do it on the blackboard. I don't even know. This is going to be the hard. This is going to be by far the hardest part of this routine, I think. Um, well, it's not this routine. It's the hardest part that happens somewhere else that makes to, in order to enable this routine. And I don't know. <clears throat> so here's the problem. So here's what we're talking about. If we said, okay, here is, you know, a voxel grid, right? Well, you know what? We can do this on 2D and make it simpler. So here's, you know, some voxel grid thing. And I'm going to cast rays from here. So let's suppose that we were building walk tables. So when we built the table, what we did is we said, well, we imagine, right, that we are at the uh, far corner of this thing and the ray direction is like whatever here. So what we do is during the pre-computation that we generate the H file, we just say, look, we know that it will cover these elements of the grid, right? So into the walk table, we say, well, how many were there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So then we know that the walk table for that ray is 12 long, right? You know what I'm saying? So then you come to the actual runtime and you say, all right, here I am. And I want to do my ray cast. <clears throat> Well, only the first three are valid, right? Because as soon as you finish, you can't go outside of, of that. So the question is, what do you do about that? All right, all right, all right. Okay, okay, okay. Better idea. We make a skirt of exactly one grid square around the entire thing. And into that grid square, we write a special value that lets us know that we're done. Then we don't ever have to do this because we just know we hit the end. And that way we never need walk count at all. 
That's the answer by far. Definitely better than what I was saying. So this is not correct. Um, this is not what we do. We do not have a walk count minus minus. We simply say that when we load up the spatial node, we just break. So this thing here, right, like is just a infinite loop. And what we do is we say, well, okay, um, in the event that we've got a certain value in there, we do one thing. And in the event where we've got another value in there, we do another thing. And that, that if is not a new if, it just replaces the if we had before on the loop invariant. So when we grab the node, we say like, look, if one pass last index equals like, you know, spatial grid node terminator or something like that, um, then we know that we've finished uh, our, our walk. So this, you know, tells us, right? Um, that seems good to me. That seems good. So we'll say like, look, if the start index maybe is like, not what we want, then off we go. Yeah. Okay, whew, that gets us out of a jam because now it's trivial and we don't care. So we just put a skirt around the whole thing, like an apron around the outside. And whenever we hit that apron, we stop. So that way we don't have to do any complex checking whatsoever. We literally just point at the table and go. That is great. That is very good. Um, okay, happy day, sunshine. So that's great. That means now we just have to think about this part. We don't have to do this, which is very good. Um, and so then we just have to start thinking about exactly how we're doing um, what we're doing here, right? So here we've got our ray D stuff. And this part, I guess, um, I guess I don't care about most of this at the moment. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to actually pull this out um, into maybe an array temporarily. Um, and this is just so that I can keep this code cleaner while we're testing. And then eventually this code will probably go away because we're going to, if this, if our routine actually ends up being faster, it might end up being slower, in which case we're sad, but you know, that's always a possibility. Um, we're going to do this, uh, we're going to remove all this code if it ends up being faster. So, uh, we don't really care if this is a little ugly at the moment. So we're gonna, inside here, we're gonna build the components uh, into an array, and then we're just gonna loop uh, over them. So <clears throat> the transfer PPS array uh, will just start as that for the moment, and then we'll have a ray index equals zero, ray index less than uh, four, plus plus ray index. And this will just serve as our temporary here, right? So we clamp the moon dir minus uh, the ray direction. So our ray d equals ray d array uh, ray index. So we grab that out. Uh, maybe I'll call that this ray d, like so. Um, so that produces our transfer PPS for this. Uh, particular pass and then we need to pass to grid cast the things you know give unto grid cast the things that are grid cast uh, and render unto transfer pps that which is transfer pps's so this is this ray d and then we've got to send some stuff down that's actually like what we need ray index ddd and 
grid ray cast now needs the following information uh, in addition to ray D. So, uh, oh, and the ray origin. So where is that coming in? Um, it's right there. All right. Yeah. Uh, it'll be nice to finally figure out what's going on here so we can get rid of a lot of this code. There's just way too much code that doesn't need to be here, but we can't really do anything about that um, at the moment because we need to test all this stuff. So it's the nature of test code is very ugly and modern programming languages don't make it easy. It's unfortunate. Anyway. So we need initial grid index, walk count, and walk table. So like so. Uh, and if I remember correctly now, what we're saying is the walk count goes away because we're just using the apron to determine whether we stop or not. So we really just need the initial grid index and the walk table that tells us like the offsets, right? Now the walk table in this case is really S16s. I mean, they're sort of deltas. So, you know, we might wanna say that um, just to be a little bit clearer about what's going on. Uh, but that's basically the idea. Uh, so now in here, when we do uh, ray D single, that doesn't actually have to happen. It's here. The walk count isn't going to be used uh, and the walk table I guess is an offset into here. So I guess what we could, we could actually still pass this as a walk table offset, I guess. Um, but I don't think we want to. So I think that's gonna go away too. Yeah. So I think that's what we want there. And I'm gonna pound to find this thing to be something. I don't really care. Um, but something that wouldn't be used. At this point, we've got a bunch of stuff to do down here. Oops, that's wrong. And I don't know what happened here. Oh. That was an old vestigial remain, it looks like, from the get component call. So there's the inner product, there's the clamp, there's the moon color. So I think that's all good. So mostly our problem now is we have to figure out how we're going to pass these two values down. So we've got a initial grid index and we've got a walk table. Uh, and what we need to do now is we just need to uh, build the things that are actually gonna provide this data. Now the problem is uh, this is gonna start to cause problems for us because of the way that this gets passed down, it's not great um, because we kind of wanted this thing to be welded into the raycast, but it doesn't really work that well with the raycast, unfortunately. Um, so if we take a look at how this is going, you can see here where we do the sampling sphere. It's this part here um, that we actually kind of needed to know about Right? So we get the sample directions out and then we do those two ray casts. Right? Mm, stretching. Um, now mind you, I don't really know why we're doing this. Um, it's not super clear that we needed to do it this way. Um, but yeah, if you look at what's going on here, so we have the loop there that would be thunking down to the raycast call, and the raycast call uh, does these texel ops to blend things together, and that could just as easily have been done on the outside. Um, <clears throat> but it wasn't. And I'm assuming that we put it in here just for convenience, uh, but there's not a lot of real reason that it should have been happening there, to be completely honest with you. 
So I'm not sure we actually need that or want that. We may actually want this to be moved to the outside, at which point we could also call grid, grid raycast to produce these values. So it's a little squinky. I'll preserve it for now, but we're going to want to unwind the meta here as soon as we can actually determine that we've picked a good route. Um, you know, I don't know that we actually have. Uh, so that's a little up in the air, but we'll we'll leave it at that. So when we actually grab our sampling sphere information out here, that's really where this information needs to come from. So when we're passing down like sample dir A and sample dir B here, I think what I'd rather do is just pass down the sampling sphere pointer, uh, and that way people can get from it whatever they want. We don't use the sample sphere stuff here um, for anything in particular, so we shouldn't actually have to do what we're doing here. Um, like if you take a look here uh, at the way this is working, we should just be able to pass the sampling spheres down and then get the uh, sample dir like direction out of it, right? Uh, <clears throat> So here's what that actually looks like. And you can see that we've got like a array of sampling directions. You know what I mean? And uh, since we know we need more than that, I feel like, again, this is kind of the thing that we now want to start to think about how these are going to get packed. So we may just want there to be a parallel array uh, in here that you get. And so like, what we know we need to load is <clears throat> we know we need the initial grid index and the end at grid index. Uh, well, actually, that's not true. We know we need just the walk table, like where the walk table is, right? Because we know what the initial grid index is and we know everything else. So we just need the location in the walk table that we would start, right? That's the only piece of information we actually care about. So in addition, so light sample direction is not super relevant. Um, so what we need here is like in addition to this thing, we need an, another array that's like how many of these, like w where do we start in the walk table? So when you load a direction uh, out of this thing, you go to the walk table and get that. However, again, looking at that, just thinking it through, you also don't cast four rays at a time anymore. So that would also mean that like, yeah, I guess the reason we set this up is this previously Um, this previously needed to work, we, we, we don't need any of this. This previously needed to work with, um, with ray bundles and it just doesn't need to anymore. So we really just have, this is all you load. So we need this like you know, that will eventually, this will go away and it'll be replaced with this thing. Does that make sense? So each sphere now, rather than having these packed together, actually has these packed together so that you have ray direction, walk table offset, and pad packed together as one 16 byte pack, right? You load up the 16 byte pack, you've got everything you need uh, and you go from there. I think that's it. And then you're going to use that walk table offset. And the walk table offset actually can be a U32 because there's nothing else to put in here. So we actually can have huge walk tables if we need to. But in theory, that should never be necessary uh, because the number of rays is not large enough. The number of different ray directions presumably is large enough. But that's fine. So at that point, we would just say, all right, that's all we actually have then. And we're going to look those up into the, in the sampling sphere. Right. Uh, now, in order to generate that, uh, yeah, so like, uh, 
Unfortunately, we don't really have a good way to generate that. At the moment. Um, Cause that's an, another part of the thing we're gonna have to write, right? But what we wanna do is make sure that the plumbing works here. So what we wanna do is make sure that this light sample direction part uh, actually gets loaded. We also kinda have a problem that like this doesn't really work now um, because this is gonna be wrong. So I guess the other thing we might wanna do is just say, look, for the time being, maybe we do this. That way we're not stepping on anyone's toes. So it's gonna look something like that, you know? So again, the problem here is that we have a light sample direction that needs to get passed down and we don't at the moment, um, we, we, we're calling Raycast to cast a bundle of four rays and now we need to do a separate call for each of those because we're casting four separate rays. And you can see why I'm not sure this routine is going to be faster because it's just like pretty tricky to figure out how this is going to work exactly. Um, not tricky to figure out, tricky to figure out whether it will actually be as, uh, less expensive or more expensive because of the way that you have to, you're doing one ray at a time instead of four rays at a time. And you're counting on tests against four things at once instead of one thing at once. So you've changed which way the 4x goes, and so that means that the meta changes. Uh, there's just a lot of differences there. So it's hard to say. Um, so what we want to do now, though, is go ahead and take a look at the, uh, the way we're going to pipe this information through. So if I take the light sample direction here and just pass this as a pointer, perhaps, temporarily, and then down here, I would say, let's get those sample directions loaded up and we'll, uh, and we'll pass them down. Furthermore, I guess this actually te technically can just come directly out of here. Um, so this can just be that and get rid of this. Okay, so we'll get this ray D and then the initial grid index can come out of there as well. Oops, not, that's, that's wrong. I meant that. Uh, so the walk table, the global walk table here that we're saying we will eventually have, uh, the light sampling walk table, that'll just be this and yeah, that also goes in here, right? So the only thing we don't have right now is the initial grid index, and we know that we need to be able to map grid indices to, uh, we need to be able to map spatial positions to grid indices. This initial grid index is something that should also get passed down because it doesn't change at all uh, for the entire thread loop. Basically, for for that entire run of that thread loop, it doesn't change. So for the raycast, it's gonna want that value to stay the same. Um, and so that should be a pretty straightforward thing as well. So when we go to, what is, what is the complaint here? Ah, yes. So when we go to raycast, basically what we're saying is like, okay, the full cast call here where we say the voxel center P thing, um, that's gonna cast everything for this voxel that we plan to cast. And so it knows exactly what the, and I mean, we probably already actually can computed it to be completely honest with you. <clears throat> yeah. So you can see we've got the Z, Y, and the X here. So what we really want is this to just know that value. So when we pass through here, we've got the initial grid index. And that initial grid index is the same for every raycast operation that we do, 
right? So when we call full cast, we would just pass that down. So it is initial grid index equals Z plus Y plus X. And when we're talking about the voxel dimensions here, right? We just do voxel dim and voxel dim. So we would do the X dimension here and oops, and the Y dimension as well here, right? If that makes sense. Uh, and since this is distributive, we can also do a little fancy footwork there and just say, you know, that's, that's that. So that's just <clears throat> maps us into the grid. Uh, and I think we probably want to make that systemic. So we probably want a thing here that's like, you know, grid index from, and we pass a bunch of like U32s, right? So that way we can change this computation uh, whenever we want and we don't have to like worry about where we put it in the code. That's all that is. So I think that's everything. And now it's more a question of actually building these data structures, but I think that everything is in the right like format for it. So hopefully that's good. And man, there's a lot of code here that does not need to be here, but you know, that's just something we're gonna have to deal with. Okay, so if we do the light sample direction, What we want to do here is say that this will be like ray bundle index, uh, probably I'm guessing for the offset. So like here are the sampling spheres. So we would say, you know, well, I don't exactly know what we would do, but we would say, um, for each sampling sphere we do, we would do, solu uh, it's not solution. It's like some global, right? Yeah. So it's just, it's just these. Um, and so we're gonna look up into one of those, for example, this, and we'd have like a sampling spheres too. I don't know why there's a pointer to that. Maybe so we could swap between different ones, but uh, right, like why is that? I don't even know why that's a thing. I'm not sure. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense of why we have that. And you can see here, right, like So let's say we've got one of these. Really, we don't need this. So we can just do light sampling sphere table two. And then we have dir sample index here. And we're gonna load out that light sample direction table. And then in the light sample direction table, we've got sample directions like so, same as before. Uh, and this time the difference is we just be jumping up by four each time because we're loading four out. And that's all of this crap is just so that it works the same for the four wide or the one wide cases, which we all wanna delete. So it's just messy right now and, and it sucks but that's just how it's gonna be for a little bit, right? So what we would say is light sample directions, sample direction, like, and we would add to it whatever the ray bundle index was. Um, and so we know that the ray bundle index is getting incremented in a particular way here, like ray bundle index plus equals two. Right, uh, and what we wanna do with the ray bundle index, I probably should have asserted that somewhere else.
And so what we want to do here is we want to pass into this routine like the pre-offsetted tables that we're going to use. And so this for sample direction plus ray bundle index. So now what we're doing is we're saying, well, okay, we really go by fours when they go by ones, right? So it's like this. Uh, I'm sorry, by eights when they go by twos, right? Um, and that should do it. And again, it's it's all kind of nasty, uh, but that's that's the way it goes. Um, so let's go ahead and look here. What else we got? That is the wrong thing. This is light sampling sphere two, right? Voxel dim. Okay, um, so I think that's all we really need there. And we just need, this is a U16, so we'll We'll do a safe truncate just so we can get a, a warning when uh, if if we blow that uh, limit. All right. So now we've got all the plumbing done, and the problem we're going to have now is just we have to generate this disaster, and we don't currently uh, generate this disaster. So we need to write the generator code that generates these, and we also need to write the sorting code that actually puts all this stuff in place. So for example, in here where we do, um, is it an end lighting computation? I don't really remember where we do it. We kind of sketched it out uh, somewhere in here, yeah. So here's like us sketching out this routine. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and you can kind of see we did most of the work, but we have not actually done the work of getting it to actually compile, right? So we need the grid build to be done. We need to get this code working. And then we need to get the generator code to generate the walk tables for each ray. And we might as well do that first because that's something we haven't sketched out yet. So we might as well sketch that out. And then maybe we'll stop there and next weekend we'll implement, we'll get those two routines working. So we'll do a sketch first. Uh, and here's where my memory should be better than it is. Because this is a routine I've written before. <laughs> Normally what I would do is I'd just go take the routine that I already wrote and use it. So it's a bit of a bummer, but I'm going to have to see if I can remember how you do this because uh, I remember it's not trivial to understand. So the thing we need to do now is that actual build. So we need to do something that, oops, if given a location in the grid, and then we want to do a raycast in the grid. Um, so we're, we're basically going like this kind of thing, right? What we then want to do is we want to say, what are all the squares that we visit? in that walk, right? So like as this thing extends out, like what do we actually hit? And in order to do that for the grid, we basically wanna see, you know, I mean, it's, it's basically like a Bresenham line drawing algorithm. You know what I mean? Like we basically wanna say we're at a particular location and like one of these grid squares will be the the one that the line touches next, right? And the question is, which one is it? And then we just keep going till we generate a, a movement of, till we know we've covered in all three directions, uh, checking all three directions until one of those directions has spanned the entire length of the voxel. Because at that point, you know you've you will have stepped out of bounds no matter what, right? Um, 
so it occurs to me when I'm thinking about this too that probably those tables were too big because we can only move one Well, no, because because we want to do it with with just one value. So never mind. Um, so yeah. <clears throat> so looking through the walk table for this, I don't know exactly how we want to do this. We want to we want to say that it's not quite a Bresenham line routine because we want to fill every one that you touch. So, like, if, for example, you were right in the middle there or right to one side or right to the other side, we want to make sure we get whoever the other pixels are to. So, we really, what we really want is we want to say from the location that we start at, wherever that is, we need to first, it's probably different on the first one than it is on the subsequent ones, but you would go and you would say how far in the ray to, along the ray do I have to go to hit each edge? And whichever one of those is less, that's the one I pick, basically, right? So you would basically say we know, so you'd know ahead of time how many grid squares you travel along the ray per unit in each dimension, right? And I guess you'd just say, based on where you are in the grid square, you know that you're gonna do, hmm. So, and just to be clear, our grids, our grids are always the same size too, right? Because that's actually important now. Because the grid has to, this, this walk table is computed for a particular size of grid, right? And that's, that's important. Now we could do it, we could do this at runtime. We don't have to pre-compute it actually, if we don't want to. We could do it at startup because it's pretty quick. Um, and maybe I will do that. And that would, that's just so in case we want to change our grid resolution at runtime. We can, that seems relatively important, right? Uh, so creating those seems like a good idea and maybe we'll do that. But what does this routine look like? Let's start, let's start sketching it. So let's suppose we wanna do this Uh, we need a couple pieces of information. So we need the voxel dimension. Uh, we need to know the light sample spheres, but those we kind of already do know. We need to know how big it is. So how big a voxel cell is. And that might be it. <clears throat> I think that might be it. And then of course we need the output and we would return the count, I guess, of how many there are, uh, just to check. Right. So when we go to compute the walk table, what we would then do is we would start at the center so we would do that's the center of a cell and then we would go we need to travel somehow uh to see <clears throat> where we're going to end up and in order to do that we have to take our voxel dimension and I'm sorry, our cell dim, and figure out how far we go for a particular ray direction. Uh, and so we need this to be inside all the ray directions, right?
for each ray direction, we're going to pull that out of somewhere, the sampling spheres. Then we're going to say we need to <clears throat> loop through until we've gone far enough in one direction, whatever that direction is. Um, so it's probably something like this. So for each dimension, we would keep track of how far we go. You know what I'm saying? So then in here we would say, <clears throat> let's figure out which direction we're going to go. And for each of these, we would say like which whatever dimension it is, like there'd be a best dimension. We would say that the span best dimension uh, increases, right? And if the, if the new span is for that dimension is greater than the voxel dimension, so we've like we know we've gone like one more than we need to go, uh, then we would say that we can stop, right? So our termination condition is just we've spanned the entire voxel in at least one of the dimensions x, y, or z. So we know that no matter where we started on the interior, we would have hit an apron before we got to the next cell we would be looking at now. So then the question is which of these uh, best dimension here, right? So we say like, where are we? We're at this starting location. We then need to say like, what's the best dimension to go along? And then we need to like, yeah, we need to figure that out. I think it'd probably look like this. <clears throat> where we just step the T best each time. And so the question is like, how do we determine what the T best is? You know what I mean? And we need to check each of the dimensions in turn. So maybe it looks like this. <clears throat> So we want to check each dimension in turn. And what we want to do is see like how far, you know, where would we, where would we have to go to get to the cell dim? And the problem here is we need to think about it in terms of a direction because we're either going, we're going either backwards or forwards, right? And I suppose that one of the things that's true about this is it doesn't really matter which one it is. So what we might do is say the ray direction comes out of somewhere and then the negation um, of which direction we're going is like a separate thing. So we might just say, let's simplify it by saying we're always going forwards. So we'll say that negation uh, in each case is like forward and we'll loop through the dimensions um, <clears throat> uh, at the beginning saying like if ray d is less than zero <clears throat> ray d e um, So we'll just negate it and set the negation parameter. You know what I mean? <clears throat> so that way we could always just assume that we're going forwards. So we can just assume that we're looking for cell dim, like we're looking to get to cell dim. <clears throat> So what we need to do is say the ray direction uh, element for the particular axis we're on. We need to just do a divide 
and we could we could turn this around we don't care this is not a time and this is not a per frame thing we're doing just happens once it's set up so we want to see how far we have to go so the cell dimension e um, minus the place we currently are <clears throat> divided by how far we travel should be this t. If that's the best one so far, uh, then this is the best dimension, right? And that's kind of it. Uh, now all we need to do is have our incrementors. Uh, so really negate was probably the wrong thing here. So probably this is actually called step, right? And so when we compute this, we would just say, what's the step that gets us to where we wanna go? And we would either fill in <clears throat> the dimension index in question, um, <clears throat> and it'll either be positive or negative. <laughs> so we could actually do this in the more like, positive frame route, right? If it's positive, we take this step. If it's negative, we take the opposite step. In this case, dim step is just one at the start, right? And for each dimension, we would multiply dim step by that dimension's uh, span when we pass through it. So in other words, for x steps, it's positive or negative one. For and then when we're done with that, we would, oops, we would multiply that by the dimension of x, right? And I think that's it. I think that's the whole routine. Um, probably forgetting something that we'll find when we step through it, but that's that's it. And so there you go. We just need to output to dest. And so we would do that here. And this is step best dim, uh, and that's it. So we now need some way of just uh, recording that we haven't gone too far. Um, so we might just say, okay, dest in this case. Well, you know what? I'm going to do this with an incrementor. Never mind. So we'll start at dest index zero and we'll do a plus plus dest index or I'll do it this way. <clears throat> uh, and that way we can also do an assertion here that dest index is less than max dest count. So that way we know. Uh, and I think that's it. At some point in here, we're gonna wanna record where we started. So when we pull out the ray D, we're also gonna wanna do a thing that's like hey, uh, this equals dest index. So like the walk table offset is this offset, right? And that's it. Not that complicated actually. Um, I might be missing something, but that was pretty trivial. So meh. I'm going to call it there for today, uh, and we'll pick up the actual implementation next weekend. We've got everything done now, and we just need to like actually blow through everything and, act and get it all running smoothly. And then we cross our fingers that it's actually a good starting point for optimization, because we don't really know that yet.
what is this nonsense? What am I seeing here? What are these what are these faked screenshots from Naysale where he's trying to claim that he got eight eighty nine thirty five on slipways? We that did not happen. We all know this is like this is like the King of Kong when Billy something or other faked his Donkey Kong, Billy Mitchell. Thank you, George. This is like when Billy Mitchell tried to pass off that fake Donkey Kong. We all know that Naysale has never had an interstellar slipways that was four stars. I mean, come on. Billy Mitchell has recently sued someone. Yeah, so I wonder what the story is about all that stuff. It was so crazy, right? Like, there's so much acrimony in this community where the entire thing is just, like, people keeping high scores. And you're like, do we even care? Maybe we do. I don't know. Billy Mitchell cares, obviously. Maybe he'll win. Maybe it turns out it wasn't faked. That's, the, that's the, like, the plot twist. I have no idea. They clearly need to be like another King of Kong documentary because it's clear that stuff's gone down. <laughs> That's the problem with sometimes making a documentary is you affect the outcome of the community you're documenting. That definitely happened with King of Kong. It definitely happened with Tiger King already. And it, it may uh, it may happen with uh, Flat Earth as well, right? It's like documentaries are not uh, are not separate from the story. They become part of the story. I don't know what I don't know what happened with the Billy Mitchell thing. The in the King of Kong documentary, they don't they kind of suggest that he may have cheated. Because they sort of hint that, well, the VHS tape doesn't look quite right or something. But they don't straight up claim that he cheated, right? But since then, Twin Galaxies claimed he cheated, right? And now he's suing them for something right? or something, right? It's, it's comp You should go read about it. It's complicated. I don't know. I wasn't there. <laughs> Can you explain more what a micro-op is? Yes, I can. Oh, where is my blackboard? Here it is. All right, so the modern execution architecture of like, you know, of like a Skylake core, Skylake-ish core, so it looks like there's no front end. There's like front end nonsense that happens up here. I don't want to use nonsense. That's dismissive. Front end uh, prep. I don't know. So there's like your instruction stream. Uh, that's like sort of what we looked at before, right? And I don't remember exactly what the instructions we were looking at, but they were like, you know, add, I don't know what it was, like add EAX or something, uh, D word pointer, brackets ECX or something. I don't remember what the instruction stream was, so part, I apologize, but it's something like this, right? And I was saying like, oh, then there's going to be like a sub... Uh, sub EDI or something. I don't, again, I don't remember what it was, but it was something like this. And then it was a JNE to a label, right? And the label was like up here. So this is like a loop, right? And it's going to do this instruction, this instruction, this instruction. And then it might keep going here or it may go up here, you know, based on whatever EDI was. So it's three instructions, and these, when we say in the word instructions, 
that's a very specific word here and it's used intentionally. These are assembly language or machine code instructions. They aren't actually things the processor executes as is, they get munged. And in the old days, that was not really maybe as true. You know, I wasn't a C64 jockey or a 68K guy or any of that stuff. But, you know, when you had the old 8, 16-bit, 32-bit microprocessors up until like the Pentium era stuff, um, typically like the assembly language instruction was what the processor executed. So like an add was an add and a, and a jump was a jump and so on. And it was just one-to-one -one. most of the time, I think. But that's not true anymore. Like modern processors are way more complicated. So basically what happens is sitting in a cache somewhere, um, well, you know, this is in memory or whatever. Sitting in a cache somewhere, it's typically called the iCache, uh, which is the instruction cache. But really uh, you can think of it as it's part of the L1 subsystem on the chip. It's the fastest possible uh, memory style cache. These will exist somewhere in here if they're, about to be executed. So they'll, inside the iCache, this data, the actual bytes that encode this will be in here. And what will happen is the front end is responsible for figuring out based on what's in the iCache, what the heck is supposed to happen. And nowadays that's actually really freaking complicated. And I probably didn't put enough space here. So what's gonna happen is each one of these instructions has to be decoded into operations that the CPU can actually perform. And for example, this instruction right here, I have sort of semi-intentionally written this in a way that makes it so that literally none of the instructions that you see are operations that actually occur. None of these are operations the CPU performs. None of them, literally. If I'm remembering correctly. So starting with this instruction, the CPU actually has multiple things it needs to do. This D word pointer reference here, this is a load. So it's a load from memory. And then this add here is an add operation for like an ALU unit. It's like an integer add. So this is really two what we call micro ops because even though it is one assembly language instruction, it's actually two micro ops, a load and an add, okay? This sub EDI is one UOP, that's a sub UOP, and this JNE label is I guess I want to say it's a zero UOP. I mean, it's really hard to classify what this is, but the JNE label is sort of a non op. And you could think of it as one UOP that gets fused to this, but you would have to be more of a optimization guy than I am to really know how to use that nomenclature correctly. If you're a microarchitecture person, you know exactly what you should say there. I don't. So I'll explain what happens in the chip roughly to the level of my knowledge. But whether you call it a UOP or not, I just don't know. Um, it depends whether you think of microops as things that issue to ALUs or ports or whether you think of UOPs as anything the chip could do. And, and so... I don't know. I would think of it myself as a zero UOP uh, instruction, but I don't know. Okay. So the front end is responsible for determining this, and here's more or less how that's going to go. Again, I don't really know. I don't have the inside knowledge on how Skylake works, so I don't know. But what basically happens is it's going to take the iCache, and it's going to go through what's called sometimes a trace cache, but really, there's multiple different micro-op caches. So these are UOP caches. There are multiple different kinds of UOP caches in the Skylake core, and which one actually operates is way beyond me. This is like has to do with loops versus non-loops, and I don't even know. 
So there's a micro op cache and a loop cache. Um, so like there's a uop one and there's a loop one here. Which one will happen in any given case, I don't know. I would assume the loop cache will happen here. It's sometimes called a hot loop cache, I think. Again, I apologize to Jeff and Fabian if they ever watch this for getting so many things sloppily in here, but I'm just trying to give you the basic idea of what happens. So please take all of this with a grain of salt. It's roughly like this. It's not exactly like this. So in here, this instruction, well, each of these instructions, when we have to start looking at it, when we know that we're going to uh, actually execute it, it will get pulled into the I cache at least, and then it will be decoded into the micro op cache as micro ops. So load, add, sub, and the non jump instruction micro op that doesn't really exist will get decoded in here. And again, I don't even really know if it gets encoded as a UOP or not. I think it does, maybe. I'm not sure. Um, there's also this thing that's made specifically for relatively small loops that are running very fast. I don't really know why, but there are two of these, and it might be in both of them because it is a tight, small loop, right? Okay, so we have secondary caching that will cache the result of decoding these actual things from instructions into UOPS. The front end does that, but the front end also is responsible for actually issuing the UOPS. So while it's doing that, which may involve fetching from the cache if it's already decoded, or going out to the iCache, getting it, and decoding it into the UOP if it hasn't, the front end will then look and see what am I actually gonna to try to do here. The front end will then try to issue UOPs from the cache, like the load add here. It will try to issue those to the back end. And the back end is this giant nasty monstrosity that's got a register allocation table, which is the thing that tries to remember what values are where. It has a retirement queue, retirement window. And the front end is gonna start looking through these UOPs and it's gonna try to shove them down through the rat into the uh, scheduler, which is here. Uh, and then they're gonna go out to the retirement window. So what's gonna happen here is first, for everything that you see, like EAX and RCX and all these things, so you may like think like, oh, you know, like how many registers, you know, does an X64 have? And someone says like, oh, it's got like 16 general purpose registers. Like, no, it has 16 general purpose register names. So you can name 16 general purpose registers. It actually has like 96 or more, like it's got a ton of registers. It's just you can only name 16 of them. And what that means is that as you do ops on registers, if you use the register multiple times and overwrite things in the instruction stream, the out of order execution nature of the processor means it can be executing many instructions from an instruction stream at once. So it renames registers as it goes so that you don't block up on the fact that you only have 16 of them and you're waiting for something. So really there's 16 names for effectively scratch space. I mean, that's the way to think of registers. They're the scratch buffer of the processor. There's 16 free scratch slots at any time. The actual number of registers in the processor is actually quite high. It's, it's I don't know how many it is, but it's much, much larger than 16 in practice. Um, so anyway, what the front end's gonna do is it's gonna try to allocate a name for the result of this thing. So it sees this ad and it says, well, I gotta load ECX, so ask the register allocation table, right? It, it, sorry, it's, it's actually looking at this now, right? I've gotta load ECX from a location in memory, so go ask the register allocation table where the heck is the value of ECX right now, because it's not in ECX because there is no such thing. There's just a giant table of values, and we just need to know where was the last time anyone in the instruction stream, stream tried to modify ECX, that's what we've got to get. So tell me where that thing is. And the rat will tell us, right? So it tells us where that thing is. Then we go, hey, scheduler, we need to schedule a, a port op for a load and that goes on port two or three, right? 
So we're going to schedule on port two or three a load into uh, this uh, from ECX into uh, a temporary location, right? Just some value we need. It doesn't have to have a name. Some value we need, and we're going to use the result of that later, right? So that's going to go into the scheduler. And the scheduler has off to the side, like all the ports. Port zero, one, two, three, four, dot, 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 right? And we know that ports two and three are the load ports. So in here, the schedule's got this load and this load is gonna be sitting there as a micro op, right? It's, an, it's a micro op load. It's sitting there as a micro op waiting for ECX. Now, Again, it's not called ECX anymore because we got some name out of here. Slot 73 is what was in the ECX for right now. So it's waiting for slot 73 to be done. When slot 73 is done, this instruction will become ready, right? And will get executed as soon as somebody has a spare port two or three. So on a cycle when a port two or three, either of those are available, the load op for uh, this, if it's ready, if, we've, if ECX has been readied, if 73, if that version of ECX has been readied, it will then issue this. When this comes out of the pipeline, some number of cycles later, in the case of a load, it's like one cycle later, if it hits L1, 14 cycles later on L2, or 300 cycles later if it's memory, who knows. Um, this load will then uh, retire out to the retirement window for micro ops. So somewhere in here, this thing gets retired and these go in order. So this will literally have like the load, the add, the sub, uh, and the jump won't be in here. The load, the add, the sub, the load, the add, the sub, right? Um, well, that's not true. The jump will sort of be in here, but it won't be in here as a jump. It's more like a verify. <clears throat> All right, so hopefully some of that makes sense. So if we take a look at what's going on here, decoding into micro ops. The micro ops come from a cache. The front end issues the micro ops. They look through the rat to figure out where the data is and to allocate space to put the data for the actual result. That result may have a name in the case of a test destination register. It may not have a name in the case of a blind load that just gets used. Those things go into the scheduler. The scheduler is in charge of looking to see for any register name that was assigned, are those registers ready? If all the registers for a micro op are ready, the, is, the micro op is ready, and it will then issue on a port when a port is available for it to issue. When it issues on the port, it will go through the pipeline, however many uh, cycles the pipeline takes for that particular instruction. It will then issue out to the retirement window. The retirement window will mark it as done and it will move to the next. It's got like a pointer and it just retires these in order, right? Um, that's how this works. When we get to some of the things I was talking about before, I said two th phrases. I said macro op fusion and micro op fusion. These are the two types of fusion that occur. Why do we care? We care because there are UOP limits and instruction limits that uh, apply. In a single cycle, the front end uh, on a Skylake core can only process four, can only decode, right? can only decode four instructions, I want to say. Don't quote me on that. So if you are seeing the code for the first time, add, sub, jump, one more, it can decode those four, I believe. Can it, is it only, is it four instructions or are only four UOPs? You know, I'm sorry, I can't remember. I don't remember if there's an instruction limit, so I'm just gonna talk about the UOP limits. All right, um, so the UOP limits are on a single cycle. This one I actually remember. You can only issue four UOPs on a single cycle. So even if, you know, there's more than four ports, right? Remember there's zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 
right? So Skylink had several ports. If we actually had UOPS to issue on all the ports, it wouldn't matter because the actual uh, issuing, so the scheduler can only issue four instructions per cycle anyway, right? So the reason we care about things like UOP fusion is because in order to actually get stuff through the chip, we have a four UOP limit. So if we can take advantage of micro op fusion, which is when two UOPs flow through the pipeline as if they were one UOP, it means that we can actually increase to like five UOPs, possibly even more per cycle even though we only have four UOPs per cycle as an actual hard limit. So you're basically cheating the pipeline by sticking an extra UOP in there. So in the case where you can get UOP fusion and you can say these two UOPs fuse together in flow, it's great. This I believe is an example of UOP fusion, a memory op and a arithmetic op that are the same, so that work together. I believe those travel as a single pair of UOPs that goes through the pipeline as if they were one you up. Don't quote me on that. Check all this out yourself. But that's an example of getting more than two, more than one you up through the pipeline uh, for only the cost of one. Now, macro op fusion is a little bit different. Macro op fusion are not you ops that travel together in the pipeline. They're instructions that travel together in the pipeline. And subjump is an example of macro op fusion. Subjump means that those two instructions actually count as a single instruction through the whole front end. So for the decode limit, for anything that's instruction bound, you actually don't pay two instructions, you only pay one, I believe. That's my recollection. So basically, if there was something that could only process four instructions, and I can't remember if it's only four instruction decodes per cycle, I'm sorry. Macro fusion means actually you can process five instructions. The reason for that is because jumps don't really exist. So you have to remember front ends, what they're doing is they're filling up this scheduler with crap. They're just throwing micro ops into the scheduler as much as they can so that the scheduler can just have as many possible instructions to work with as it possibly can, right? Because the more things you have in the scheduler, the more likely the scheduler is to be able to find one to put on each of the ports every cycle, right? So you're trying to make sure that every cycle the scheduler has four things to execute. And the best way to do that is to fill it with as many things as you can. So what the front end's actually doing is when it sees this jump, it doesn't actually sit around waiting. It just uses the branch predictor. So in here, you've got the branch predictor and the branch predictor goes for this address and maybe some other state, who knows? Guess, am I gonna take the next instruction or am I gonna jump and take this instruction? And then it will just keep going. So the front end is just gonna run through this as fast as it can, slamming crap into the scheduler, right? Add sub, add sub, add sub, add sub, add sub, add sub. It's just, right? And for the case of this particular thing, since these are both cheap, it doesn't pile up because the, the ports can issue this, can uh, execute this just as fast as the front end can handle it. But imagine you had something more expensive. Like imagine instead of an add, this was a div so that these started to get really backed up. You just have like dib sub, dib sub, dib sub, dib sub, dib sub. Those would just get stuffed in here. You just have like a crap ton of divs sitting in the scheduler, right? Okay. So then what happens is at some point, the branch predictor fails. It guessed that you were gonna jump back and you didn't, you kept going. That's what hap where the retirement window flush comes in. So then what happens in here, the memory I said this doesn't really exist. Well, there's a verification though that does. So something in the retirement window, and I have no idea how this works. Something in the retirement window is just says check. Check to see whether the flag was actually set. And it'll do that check. And if the flag doesn't match the thing the branch predictor thought the flag was, it will then flush. So it'll say like, oh crap, everything that was in this speculative chain needs to get not retired, right? So it will undo all of the operations back to wherever it you know, started speculatively executing. It'll roll those back. Do not know 
how that is implemented. No idea. But that's what will happen. So you don't really have jump instructions in here per se. What you have is abort. Like you have like oops instructions that say uh, I, I screwed up. Let me roll back. That's why you talk about branch misprediction penalty. Right? And that's why it's so high. It's why it's like 20 cycles or whatever, right? Um, it's because it's got to go like, hey, yeah, the pipeline was probably 20 cycles, 10 cycles long. Who knows how long the pipeline is? Everything that was in the pipeline that I issued speculatively past the branch, which could be quite some time, it's all wrong. So we're in trouble. If we were waiting on a memory access to come back to tell us that, it could be huge, right? It could be like 300 plus cycles because all the stuff we issued, every single operation we issued, uh, well, I don't know if that's actually true because we may not even have enough in the retirement in the window for that. I mean, maybe there is. I'm not sure. The, ra the retirement window may not be long enough for some of these. I don't know how long it is. But point being, it can be way more than 20 cycles if we're... If if the branch mispredict was on a memory load type thing, was or dependent on a memory load, then we go through and we're like, oh crap, we did a ton of work and it's all wrong. You know what I mean? So. I don't think they fuse the instructions anymore. Take a look at loop, loop E, and loop any on UF set info. They take a lot of view ups. What do you mean by you don't think they fuse the instructions anymore? Skylake fuses instructions all the time. I don't know if the new core does, the 10 nanometer core, or the, yeah, the 10 nanometer plus cores or whatever. Oh, I see. No, right, right, right. Yeah, no, I'm not talking about the compiler. The compiler is not involved here. I'm talking about the, the core fusing the instructions. What if it is an HTML div in the scheduler? Um, is that what WebAssembly is? Like, does WebAssembly, you know, it's basically like the front end it issues a div and then it has to issue a whack div to like, this is the retirement window this is this is the retirement window uh and yeah um printf armin says they do even crazier instructions question yeah like my understanding was that the instructions per clock because it's hard to push the clock rates up, they're trying to get more aggressive on instructions per clock. So my assumption would be that a lot of, like the 10 nanometer core stuff, like Ice Lake and stuff, probably tries to do even crazier crap, right? Like the front end, because the bottom line is like ALUs, I don't think there's a lot going on there. Like, I don't know that there's been much innovation in ALUs. I mean, maybe there is, I don't know, but I don't think people are coming up with like brilliant new ways to add numbers faster. Maybe they are, but I doubt it. So the ALUs don't really get that much faster. Mostly what they're doing is they add intelligence to the front end and stamp down more ALUs. So if the front end can look at more instructions and there can be four adder ALUs instead of two or, you know, eight instead of four or whatever, you know, all of that stuff is basically there to just try to get more performance out of not actually getting any faster at any individual thing, but doing more things in parallel. So...
All right, I think we're all good here. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining me for another episode of Handmade Hero. It's been a pleasure coding with you, as always. If you would like to follow the series at home, you can always pre-order the game on handmadehero.org, and it comes with a source code so you can follow along with it at home. I'll be back here next week, um, and I will go now and remove the Kickstarter banner from our webpage because Kickstarter is over. In fact, there it is. It's over. Hope you got in before it was over. If not... Well, you know, don't be sad. Um, so that's it. I don't know if John's streaming today. Probably not because he commented on the stream just now. But uh, maybe he'll stream some slipways so he can prove. No, I said probably not. Okay, but I want to see where are the where is the proof that you got four stars there, my friend? Because I do not. You did not get four stars on tough. We all know that that didn't happen. Naysail just doesn't have those kind of skills. Especially not after last night where I had to, to bail you out when the hordes were attacking. Yeah, you should have obs it. At this point, if, the, if those are actually real screenshots, then you're better at slipways than I am by a long shot. So I should probably be watching you for the pro tips. All kidding aside. Um, but yeah. There really aren't save games in slipways because you just kind of play you know, a 30 minute game and that's it. There's, there's not, it doesn't really persist like that. That's a very good point. That's a very good point. Although I think I streamed mine. I think mine was on stream. So that does, that I do have the recording of that on my hard drive here. All right, that's it everybody. Take it easy.